Uh, in this session, I'll briefly introduce you to eCampus Ontario and a tech sandbox. Then Natasha will talk about uh, UDL and its practices and principles. Then Alice will join us to talk about uh, Joe and how it integrates UDL into uh, their product. Uh, and you know uh, the tools that have at Jove, and we review a case study with them. And uh, we also share some further resources and events in case you want to learn more about their product. Uh, and we will have some time for Q&A at the end. Okay, just to give you a little bit of a background uh, about eCampus Ontario, as most of you know, uh, eCampus is a nonprofit organization funded uh, by the government of Ontario that leads a group of 53 publicly funded colleges, universities, and indigenous institutes across Ontario. Our goal is to uh, promote the use of educational technologies and digital learning environments, particularly through our department at Tech Sandbox, where we create a safe, risk-free space for institutions to experiment with educational technology tools. So Sandbox portal, uh, that I'll drop a link in the chat, so many links here, um, is basically a platform that helps educators discover tools, pilot them for the uh, short term and explore their pedagogical potential, review, uh, pi uh, review their capabilities through our standard assessments, and adopt technologies by accessing community support channels, resources, and product information. If you have any questions or feedback about our programs, please send us an email. I, I shared our email in the chat as well. And feel free to join our community space using the la uh, last link. So uh, the focus for today's webinar that is sponsored by Jove uh, is to discuss UDL, Universal Design for Learning that believe can create value for digital teaching and learning. Technologies such as Jove support our mission of making learning more accessible for everyone. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Alice and Natasha. Alice Pistono, uh, Science Outreach Manager at Jove, is a scientific uh, communicator, educator, and PR expert with a Master of Science degree in Natural Sciences from UCL. TEDx speaker and digital PR consultant. Alice has presented at various conferences as is the recipient of GCI award, 10 outstanding young persons for culture. And we have Natasha uh, from our team, uh, our accessibility specialist at eCampus Ontario. Uh, she holds a master of education in developmental psychology from Ontario Institute of uh, Studies in Education at University of Toronto. With that, I'll turn it over you, uh, to you, Natasha. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Mo, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to have you all here today. As Mo mentioned, my name is Natasha Jobamputra, and I'm the Accessibility Specialist here at eCampus Ontario. And our topic today is Universal Design for Learning, otherwise known as UDL, and how it can be effectively applied in STEM fields and beyond. So as many of you may know, STEM, or Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, is crucial for preparing students for the future but it also presents some unique challenges, especially for students with disabilities. And that's where UDL comes in, as it offers a framework to make learning accessible for everyone. So some things that I'm gonna go over are some challenges in the STEM fields when it comes to inclusion. Um, we're gonna go over UDL, the three principles, and then we're also gonna talk about how you can use videos as teaching tools. So let's review some of the specific challenges students with disabilities may face in STEM fields. Firstly, let's discuss the heavy reliance on visual aids in STEM courses. Think about 
complex concepts often explained through charts, graphs, and other visual tools. For students with visual disabilities, this can cause significant barriers to understanding the material. Imagine trying to grasp intricate scientific theories without being able to see the diagrams that accompany them. Next, let's consider the physical accessibility of laboratory settings. Many labs, unfortunately, are not designed with accessibility in mind. And for students with mobility disabilities, this can make it really difficult for them to fully participate in experiments or hands-on activities that take place within the lab. Another challenge is the compatibility of STEM activities with assistive technologies. Students who rely on screen readers, voice-to-text software, or other assistive technologies often face difficulties when engaging with digital tools and resources that are commonly used in STEM education. And this lack of compatibility can really hinder their learning process and make it harder for them to keep up. Traditional teaching methods also fall short of being inclusive. The standard model of lectures and assessments may not cater to the diverse learning needs of the students. And the one size fits all approach can really result in a mismatch between instructional methods and students' learning needs, leaving some students at a disadvantage. And finally, let's talk about the use of complex symbols, acronyms, and technical language in STEM subjects. And this specialized terminology can really be difficult for all students to grasp, but it's particularly challenging for those with language processing difficulties or even for whom English is a second language for. And this technical jargon just adds an additional layer of complexity making comprehension more difficult. Now, why should we implement UDL in STEM? And see, here are some compelling reasons. Implementing UDL in STEM courses has been shown to increase student engagement by 78%. When students are provided with multiple ways to access content, engage with material, and demonstrate understanding, they're more likely to be motivated and involved in their learning. Additionally, 85% of educators have reported improvements in student learning outcomes when using UDL principles. So by accommodating different learning styles and needs, UDL helps students achieve a deeper understanding of STEM concepts. And educators themselves find that UDL not only benefits students, but it also enhances their own teaching experience by making it more dynamic and inclusive, where 74% of educators have noted increased job satisfaction. So I said a lot about challenges faced in STEM fields and benefits of UDL, but you're probably wondering, what is it? What is UDL? So Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, was developed by the Center for Applied Special Technology, commonly known as CAST. UDL is a comprehensive framework that's designed to make educational materials and activities accessible to all learners. It's not just about helping a few, it's about creating a more inclusive environment where everyone can thrive. Now you might be wondering, how does UDL achieve this inclusivity? And the answer lies in its emphasis on flexibility. UDL underscores the necessity for adaptable approaches that can be customized to meet the diverse needs of individual students. So think about it as a toolkit for educators filled with strategies that can really be tailored to support each unique learner. But what makes UDL truly powerful are its three core components, which serve as the foundation for this framework. So let's break it down. First, we have multiple means of representation. And this principle encourages presenting information in various ways, ensuring that all students can comprehend the material regardless, 
of their preferred learning needs or learning style. Second, we have multiple me means of engagement. And this is all about motivating students by offering different ways to participate and interact with the content. Engagement is key to keeping learners interested and invested in their education. And finally, there are multiple means of engagement where this principle focuses on providing students with various options to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding. Whether it's through writing, speaking, or technology, the goal is to really accommodate different forms of communication and expression. So within these three principles, CAST has developed a set of guidelines to support educators in implementing UDL effectively. So let's explore those a little bit. So as I mentioned before, multiple means of representation is the idea that learners should be provided with various ways to access information and content. So let's delve into guideline number one under this principle, which is all about perception. The idea here is to interact with flexible content that offers multiple modalities and perspectives. And this is particularly vital in STEM where understanding can sometimes be a challenge. So one effective strategy is to use visual representations like graphs and diagrams supported by text descriptions. Another strategy is providing both auditory and visual explanations, which cater to different learning styles and needs. So some students may prefer listening to explanations while others might, might benefit from reading or seeing the information presented. Moving on to guideline number two, which focuses on language and symbols. The goal here is to communicate through languages that create a shared understanding. So a key strategy here is to use plain language and consistent terms. Avoiding using jargon and complex words that might confuse learners, having a glossary of these types of jargon and complex words um, can also further understanding. This way, if a student encounters an unfamiliar your term, symbol, or acronym, they have a handy resource to clarify its meaning, which can really bridge the gap between these abstract ideas and a more concrete understanding. And finally, let's talk about guideline number three within this principle, which is building knowledge. And this refers to constructing meaning and generating new understandings. So this can include hands-on experiments and interactive simulations to allow for a deeper exploration. Collaborative projects are also a fantastic way to encourage peer learning and discussion. When students work together, they can share different perspectives and insights that can really enrich their overall learning experience. Multiple means of engagement is all about acknowledging and incorporating the very interests and backgrounds of learners to create a more inclusive and motivating learning environment. So let's start with guideline number one in this section, which is welcoming interests and identities. And this guideline emphasizes the importance of incorporating learners diverse interests and backgrounds into the curriculum. For instance, by providing options and topics and projects, we can really enhance a student's motivation and commitment. Next, uh, we have guideline number two, which is sustaining effort and persistence. And to understand this guideline, it's essential to establish clear and attainable goals for students. So employing a variety of teaching methods is really key to keeping engagement levels high. And finally, guideline number three for multiple means of engagement is emotional capacity. And this guideline involves creating a supportive environment where students can feel safe and encouraged to take risks. Offering constructive feedback is crucial in boosting confidence and resilience. 
and multiple means of expression focuses on offering different ways for learners to express their understanding, ensuring that each student has the opportunity to showcase their knowledge and skills in a manner that suits them best. So the first guideline within this principle is interaction. And this guideline emphasizes the importance of group projects, peer reviews, and utilizing interactive simulations and virtual labs, where these tools provide a more practical experience and instant feedback, allowing students to demonstrate their knowledge in a more hands-on manner. And it's all about making learning, learning a dynamic and engaging process. Moving on to the second guideline of this section, which is expression and communication, where this principle enables learners to showcase their understanding through various formats, such as reports, presentations, coding projects, models, et cetera. And by allowing students to express their knowledge in these different ways, we can really cater to diverse learning styles and help them develop essential communication skills. And finally, we have the guideline of developing strategies. And this involves giving step-by-step -step instructions and assistance to help students organize their thoughts and strategies effectively. So tools such as using flowcharts, diagrams, checklists can be incredibly beneficial in this process. And then as students become more confident in their abilities and their strategies, we can then phase out this type of support, which can encourage independence and more self-reliance. So we're gonna move on to our last topic, which is using videos as teaching tools. And here we're going to review the benefits and then we're going to go into some accessibility considerations when implementing videos into teaching. So let's begin with one of the most significant advantages of videos, which is their ability to help students visualize complex subject matter. And in STEM courses, we often deal with abstract concepts that can be really difficult to grasp through traditional teaching methods alone. Videos, however, can really break down these complexities and present them in a more digestible and engaging format. Videos allow us to introduce real world applications of more theoretical concepts. And this is crucial because it bridges that gap between textbook material and practical implementation. Another compelling benefit of videos is the flexibility they offer. Students can pause, rewind, and review the content at their own pace. And this is particularly beneficial for grasping that content, that content that's a little bit more challenging, as it allows students to revisit more difficult sections and learn at a speed that suits them best. Videos are also incredibly effective for demonstrating laboratory procedures and experiments. While in-person lectures and classroom discussions are really invaluable, videos can supplement these by providing a visual reference that students can access at any time. And this ensures that students fully understand the procedures before they attempt them in the lab setting. So some accessibility considerations when implementing videos is first and foremost, all videos should include captioning and transcripts. And this practice allows students with hearing disabilities to fully engage with the content. Captions can also benefit students who prefer reading along or are in a more noisy environment. Next, it's essential to optimize videos for assistive technology such as screen readers. And this adaptation is crucial in aiding students with visual disabilities, allowing them to navigate and comprehend video content effectively. Another critical element, especially for videos, is providing audio descriptions for visual elements that are present in videos. And these descriptions need to be detailed enough 
to convey essential visual information that would otherwise be missed. Ensuring videos are paced appropriately, so not too fast, not too slow, is vital for allowing all students to follow along comfortably. And this balance helps maintain engagement while ensuring comprehension. Accessibility extends to using high contrast visuals and ensuring text within these videos is also large, clear, and readable. Also in videos, if there is text, make sure, making sure that there's a description of, the, of what that text is saying is also going to be extremely helpful. And so high contrast and clear text are particularly helpful for students with visual disabilities or reading disabilities. So I'm going to now pass it over to Alice and she's going to show us some practical applications of using UDL with Jove. Thank you so much, Natasha, and thank you more for introducing me earlier. Um, as Natasha mentioned, I am now going to um, go a little bit more in depth with the main features that we actually can find in some of the Jove videos and actually all of the Jove videos that you will find on the platform. Uh, now, before we actually begin to speak about Jove and some of the main um, main components of every video which make them accessible to a variety of different learners. I would like to introduce Jove as it is, as, as, as a resource, because some of you might not be familiar with it. So just to give you a little bit of context, the word Jove itself is an acronym. It stands for Journal of Visualized Experiments. So the word itself, it suggests what it does. Imagine a big platform where you can browse all of the different videos, very similar to many, many other video libraries that you find around the web, but with a difference. All of the videos that you find on the Jove platform are either peer-reviewed protocols that are experiments in a way. So they are experiments that have been peer-reviewed by the community and then turned into a video that allows you to replicate anything that the person is describing, the research group is describing in the actual um, experiment in the, in the protocol, or they are videos, animated videos that showcase some of the main core areas of development for students. And those videos span from the early years of higher education with very, very basic concepts all the way down to the end of your master's degree when students will be learning about the most advanced techniques and trying to replicate some of them in the lab. So when we say Jove is a video producer, I don't just mean any video producer, it's actually the world leading producer and provider of science videos. And the idea is anything that you will find on the Jove platform has the mission to go towards advancing research and education. As I mentioned earlier, there are two main areas. One is the Jove journal, where you can find all of these protocols. The other is the Jove education section, where you can find videos to help students learn and faculty advance in their methods and make their process of putting together lectures a little bit more interactive and a little bit more fun as well. And lots of data here to convince you that, is a big, that it is a big platform, um, one of which is there's more than 18,000 videos on the platform itself. So when you go and browse and you search by keywords, you will find a variety of different options for you and for all types of levels that we're aiming for uh, when it comes to learning and teaching. Lots of subscriptions worldwide. It's, it's a subscription model that involves institutions. So users themselves cannot access unless their institution has previously subscribed to the platform. Uh, but in my long experience working at Jove, uh, what happens during many webinars is people connect, they don't even realize that the majority of um, the institutions they belong to actually do have an active subscription. So what I recommend if you wanna check if you do have access to these videos, which chances are you will, um, you just go onto the jove.com platform and from there you can enter your institutional email address. Many, many people discover that they actually can use all of these videos for free because their institution has already subscribed. And one thing that I find pretty cool, um, there are many, many, many users around the world collaborating on different projects as well, using the videos as a reference point. If you think about how much time has been spent on the Joe platform in 2023, 
that accounts for almost 1 million years. So it gives you a ballpark on, on how useful these videos have been, not only for the scientific community, but also, as I mentioned, for students who really use them in their day-to-day -day routine to support their learning process. But we're here to discuss UDL specifically and accessibility and many of the features that Natasha was just describing related to the videos are not just important to find in some videos. For some students, they might be fundamental in the learning process. So what I'm gonna show you now is a series of Jove videos and their main features. But before we begin, I would actually like to ask you a question. So, Mo, if you could launch our first poll, I would like the audience to tell us how often have you all used videos in class? If you could give me a ballpark and get, let me know what your main trends are. I can see that a lot of people are answering frequently at, all, at almost every lecture, which is the majority of you, to be fair. Only 5% is telling me I've never used a video before, uh, which is you know, it's it's good to know because it's it's nice to know that we we still have something to learn about how to make them useful. Uh, but I'm sure that most of you who already have had an approach might be familiar with some of the things we're going to talk about. But perhaps you might still get some tips and tricks on how to make your lectures more engaging, even if you have used videos in the past. So thanks everybody for answering this first question. I will then show you, just sharing the results with you all, um, but I would like to show you how some of these features that Natasha was talking about actually integrate very well within the video. So this is a screenshot of what you can find on the platform itself. If some of you are already browsing and navigating through the platform as I speak, uh, you might find exactly this video even uh, in one of our chapters and see the main uh, areas of accessibility. One of them is pretty evident, subtitles and the presence of multiple languages. So very importantly, when we think of students and how they interact with our visual material, one thing that comes to mind is not everybody will speak the same language. Not everybody will be a native speaker of English. I myself, when I started studying at university, um, my first language is not English. I had not spoken English very well before, and I wasn't familiar with much of the jargon involved in the STEM field. One thing that we try to avoid as much as possible is using technical terms when we approach a new concept. But for science, it's truer than ever that some words can't be replaced with anything else. And learning in a, in a language, trying to switch to another one all of a sudden can be extremely challenging, even for the most proficient students. And so in this case, what you can find on the platform is a variety of features to tackle this issue. Or even for some people, I, you know, Jove is a global company, we interact with people all over the world, they might not be interested in learning in English at all. Some people might just be learning in Spanish, for example, and they would be, you know, very, very pleased to know that the videos are not just available with automated captions, that there is actually a voice over that speaks in a language that people can understand and students can go through the concepts in their native language without having to make that extra effort. The pick, sorry, the papers out there are already in English. There's a lot of difficulties trying to keep up with how the scientific community moves, how quickly it moves. Having things in your own language, in your native language, can help students um, make, make unbelievable progress. When you click on any video on the Joe platform, you will find this tiny drop down menu, uh, which gives you access to the two features. So it's both audio and subtitles that you can see in many different languages. And all of these will not just help you through the high contrast to make sure that the student can keep up. But remember, some people can't hear and having subtitles becomes fundamental to make the video accessible to everybody. So, as I said, two things. One, enhance accessibility for those who are switching between languages, learning in a new language, learning in English for the first time, for example, by resorting to their own native language, resorting to the jargon they are familiar with, but they're trying to transition um, away from. And then also for those who obviously will need the subtitles in the first place to access the video. But then we have 
Another feature that Natasha mentioned that I'd like to uh, get your attention on, which is the playback speed. Now, playback speed is something that a lot of people don't even consider, um, but trust me, you can play around it, around with it, and it can be an extremely useful tool when it comes to making the video more accessible. One example, very clear, is making it slower. If people are not understanding, if you know, the, the voiceover is a little bit too fast for them to keep up, then playback speed can obviously be adjusted. But conversely, somebody might just need to skim through the concepts to look at the images quite quickly. Remember, these are animated videos that I'm showing you. There's many others, there's videos showing real people. But in this case, if there's an animation, they might just need the animation to progress quite quickly and go through the main concepts just for revision. One of my favorite applications of um, accessibility through playback speed was given to me by a student actually, who uh, some time ago told me, I use the videos and I love the videos because I'm not very good at drawing, she said. And sometimes I need to revise some concepts. In particular, she was talking about the Krebs cycle, which is a very important concept in cell biology. She said, when it comes to drawing the Krebs cycle, it takes me forever to go through all of the steps and draw it myself. But with an animation and a muted audio and a playback speed reduced to a minimum, what I can do is I can use the pre-existing video to go through the concepts, to speak on top of it, and my brain is able to revise everything that I need to go through much more easily. So she would use the video as an aid, as an assistant to her learning process, just through the visuals. And then another extremely important feature, a highly descriptive audio. Now, again, speaking of, you know, students I've interacted with in the past, one of the most starking examples that, you know, I was presented with at one point was a student from the University of Milan who is visually impaired. He is blind. And he left us um, some feedback saying, oh, I love your videos. I watch them all the time. They help me learn so much better. And you can imagine the first time we read this comment, we thought it was somehow a prank or probably something not as serious as it turned out to be, because a blind person using videos is not the most intuitive thing one could think of. But then we, we spoke to him, we spoke to his professor, and they said, oh, we love Joe, we love the videos, because the audio is so highly descriptive that it beats any text, that like any spelled out function, anything that we have had before in terms of accessibility. This is because... When you have text, and I saw somebody put a little heart there, thank you for doing that. Um, when you have a text and a visually impaired person tries to approach that text, for example, the majority of the tools will just read out loud. And guess what? When there is an image in the text, in a textbook, for example, what it will say is, just like the picture shows, blah, 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 blah. And that's massively unhelpful for somebody who can't see the picture. But in the videos that you find here, what we tried to do for every single image that we would present was to describe it. So instead of finding some areas that say, or some bits that say, oh, just like you can see in the video, what it says is the video shows a molecule where the two bonds are oriented at a 106 degree angle. And that allows even a person who wouldn't normally be able to actually see the video to visualize it in their brain. And this student was actually one of the top performers when it came to lab experiments, because again, all of the videos showcasing lab techniques on the Jove platform, he would use and listen carefully to, to actually address the, the workspace, the lab area, use all of the different reagents, of course, with some assistance, but thanks to his ability to visualize what was being described in the video, he found the video to be more helpful than a person who's not visually impaired trying to describe what was around him. So highly descriptive audio, extremely important, not just for this case that I've described, but even for people who might be taking notes while you're speaking. Most lectures are made of a person speaking and students taking notes. A video requires your attention all the time, even when you are not watching it, being able to hear and understand what's going on without having to look at the video can be helpful, actually extremely helpful. 
Which brings me to a second poll that I would like to ask all of you. If Mo could launch the second one, I am curious to know about your favorite accessibility features. So the question is, what do you use the most in a video? A lot of people answered before, and I was actually um, quite impressed that the majority of you had used videos either at every lecture or almost like very, very uh, often. Um, now, I'm receiving lots of great answers, but uh, it's pretty evident that the majority of you are using subtitles um, like above everything else. But surprisingly, a lot of you also use the speed up, slow down function. There is about 25% of the respondents who just said they use about um, they use that, that function more than anything else. Um, screenshots apparently are not as widely used. Um, and video snippets are, you know, getting closer. But uh, I would like to share the results with you all as well so you can take a look and see what the others are doing. Clearly, subtitles are the preferred one. I'm not surprised. I use them all the time. Even when I watch things in my own like native language, sometimes I put subtitles so I don't miss anything. Uh, so it is always everybody's favorite. But I was pretty surprised by the second one. So this brings me to another few features that we need to think of, though. So we mentioned a few, all of the ones that I showed you and the ones that you voted on are extremely important. But remember, the video itself is not sufficient. And you know that already. I am sure that you know that all of you using videos during a lecture, I'm certain that you don't just put up a video and say goodbye, students learn through this. Um, there's many other things that one can address when it comes to accessibility. And for example, one of the features is related to the tra transcripts. Transcripts are fundamental, not just for note taking and reporting and referencing, but also because when somebody's getting lost, they can resort to the transcript to get the information more quickly. Or very simply said, it can be used as a piece that you take and you share with your students directly if you need a very quick and easy description. And also quizzes. People don't often think as qu of quizzes as an accessibility tool. Well, think of all of the people who need to be stimulated by failing before they learn. Some people, when they approach a new topic, they might not feel stimulated to learn unless they are confronted with their lack of understanding first. And having a quiz there, all of the Joe videos that you find on the platform, they have some questions, preset questions associated with them it can really, really empower your workflow because the majority of people who will learn through videos, they will need some consolidation. It can be done in a variety of different ways. Quizzes are a great way to do it. And finally, I would like to discuss with you all a case study that I came across. I, I said I had had a couple of interactions that were meaningful to this topic with students, but I think the most interesting way to address UDL uh, was presented to me by this professor at the University of Pisa. So let's picture his situation. This professor had uh, a class of about 60 students all distance learners who were supposed to learn the basics of chemistry. So the course was introduction to chemistry and the students came from very, very diverse backgrounds. They came, so they all got to have that session during the day, but they lived in entirely different time zones, starting from the United States all the way down to Pakistan. They all needed to connect a certain time of the day, very early in the morning for some, very late at night for others. And they were using that hour to try and make the most of their learning experience by distance learning. And again, the level of preparation was absolutely not the same for everyone. And what this professor tried to do was not only being, you know, quite, quite homogeneous in the way he would then address some of the problems, uh, but he also said, OK, my goal here is not just to bring the students to the same level at the end of this course. I want to make sure that whatever their issues are, I can address them during the lesson, during the lecture. I don't want to get to a point where I realize there is a huge problem going on with a certain group of people and I haven't been able to address it beforehand. So he used the videos, yes, 
but he actually used them in what I think is one of the smartest ways to make sure that you get a good grasp of everything that's happening and you're making sure that your material is accessible for everyone. First, he would start with a traditional lecture. So he was teaching in English. Um, again, English was not everybody's first language. Some people were using it as a lingua franca, but it could have been their second or third language. So he would start by explaining key concepts in a short 10 minute module. So the first bit of the lesson would be, hi everybody, welcome. Let's have a look at this very, very basic concept. I don't know, let's have a look at the structure of a, an atom, for example. Then he would progress onto a short video. So anything he explained in those 10 minutes, that's good for some learners. But then he said, okay, what if some people need some visual aids? What if some people need subtitles in their own language? What if people need to just like consolidate the knowledge through some simulation that is different than me speaking? He then played the video, two minutes, those videos that you find on the platform, the lab ones, the, one, the ones recorded with people, they're a little bit longer, but the animations are two to three minutes. So quite snappy. And then, he would actually put up a QR code and ask the students to answer questions. And that allowed him to do a few things. First of all, through the QR code, students would be more engaged. They would be like, oh, wow, I've just received an explanation. And then I watched the video. So different areas have been stimulated already. Now I need to test my knowledge. I need to let them know if I understood things correctly. And that would bring us to the real value of this approach, which was getting immediate feedback. This way, through this process, he was actually able to make sure that the students were keeping up. He would be able to say, OK, why is half the class not answering this, not answering this correctly? Is the concept still a little bit rusty? Should I go through it again? And the fact that it was so varied, the fact that the questions were directly related to the video they had just watched, it allowed him to understand how the accessibility of his lecture was going and to make adjustments. And this is, I think, in my experience working at Jove, one of the clearest examples of how using different tools, multimedia tools, can really, really help making all of the lectures accessible at all levels. But the question remains, how do I make sure I can do that correctly for my reality? I said it can be good for all levels, all professors, all students. It, it can be true, but it's extremely tricky to select the right material. There's 18,000 plus videos on the platform, and I'm not just talking about our platform. One can use videos from you know different places and different resources. Um, how do you select the right ones? Well, when it comes to the Joe videos themselves, if you have access to Jove and you find out that you do and you're like, oh, wow, I have all of these you know, databases for me. What do I do with them? There's actually a, an opportunity to get free support. It's completely you know, included in the, um, in the subscription where a person who is a Jove proficient scientist who also has a background in education tells you these are the most commonly used videos for your course. You share your syllabus and these videos are directly associated with what you teach. They can be associated with the most commonly used textbooks as well. That happens a lot. But also all of the videos can then be put into your LMS, whether that's Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard. There is an opportunity to take those videos and put them directly into the LMS. And that makes for a much, much more seamless integration of everything. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for staying with us until the end.